Hello, everyone. Um, I am Joanne Du, Dean and Professor at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to our Treaties Recognition League Artist Talk with Q Rock, um, who is an Anishinaabe artist selected for the Daniels Mural Project. First, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the huron wendat the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. Tonight, we invite Q Rock to share his past work and his inspirations and working process for the mural being installed at the North facade of the Daniels building. Q Rock is an artist from the Ipinson First Nation. For those who came to the Orange Shirt Day hosted at the Daniels faculty, you may recall Q Rock's personal reflections about the impacts of residential schools on himself and on his family. His words were so powerful that day and have stayed with me ever since. For those who are unfamiliar with the Daniels Murals Project, Q Rock was the successful candidate from an open proposal call evaluated by an all indigenous advisory panel. This project is an important step for the Daniels faculty on our path to respond to the calls to action identified in answering the call, which he which he, he know Tom, you, you tease Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. This project specifically responds to call to action number two, a strategy for the funding and placement of more indigenous public arts across all three campuses in close consultation with local indigenous communities. This project would not be possible without the support by the post-secondary education fund for Aboriginal learners at the University of Toronto and Street Art Toronto. I'm proud of this work and look forward to seeing the completed installation of the mural. Following Q's talk, he will be in conversation with Carolyn Taylor, a project manager of Street Art Toronto, our generous partner of this project. And we all look forward to his talk and the ensuing conversation. Now, I would like to welcome Q Rock to share with us his visions and his works and his hopes um, in working with us on this project. Q? Anin, Chemi Gwech, thank you so much for those kind words. And uh, greetings to everyone who's here. My name is uh, Q Rock, and um, I am the artist uh, who designed the uh, window installation that has just begun this week. And uh, really honored and grateful to have this opportunity to, to be a part of this project. And um, yeah, I'm just grateful to be here today. Is there any chance I could see the screen that I'm talking in? <laughs> Hello? <clears throat> I could only see, there we go. All right, so um, I guess I'll just give you guys like a kind of like a fast forward version of a bit of my story and where I come from. So I was born in Nipissing First Nation, uh, also known as Nibesing, and um, I grew up um, I grew up fairly in a very um, uh, I, I don't want to say a traditional home, but I grew up with traditional ways. And uh, I was fortunate that my grandmother, um, who spoke our language fluently, was one of our language speakers in our community. And um, my family was uh, very much uh, holding on to our traditional ways of living. And um, I was, at a young age, raised uh, to be an Anishinaabe uh, person and, um, and follow the ways of the teachings of the Anishinaabe people. So I grew up um, very much a part of my community's uh, traditional side of, of uh, how, we, uh, how we are within our community, uh, our roles and responsibilities as human beings. And, um, 
and it was just a really, uh, I was very fortunate. I always look back and I've met, I've come across a lot of people that are indigenous from Turtle Island who never were raised with their family or weren't raised in their traditions. So I look at the upbringing that I had, um, as rough of as it may have been, I was still very fortunate that I was able to be uh, surrounded by people who were still practicing our culture, um, still still living the lifestyle of being Anishinaabe, and uh, it had a huge impact on me for the rest of my life. Um, <clears throat> when I left my reserve, uh, I was completely foreign to everything outside of where we were from. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit North Bay, Ontario, um, just outside of North Bay is where my reserve is. And my reserve is a fairly large reserve. And we've been fortunate where we've had um, a lot of community uh, support and building since the 70s. And um, I've been surrounded by great leaders. Um, a lot of the chiefs from my reserves, uh, from my reserve, um, were very um, uh, community driven to help rebuild. Uh, Nibesing into becoming a strong nation again. And uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like they succeeded. Um, so growing up being Anishinaabe, uh, as soon as I went into, as soon as I left my reserve, uh, essentially I was introduced to Western culture and I was actually really shocked. I was, I had never seen stop signs before. I had never seen buildings higher than two stories I had never seen lights, like traffic lights. I'd never seen sidewalks. I'd never seen a lot of things. And the first initial um, influence of the city, I was really scared and I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to go back home. And um, I started to see what people were doing, what was considered, I guess, pop culture. And um, I was born in the 80s, 1980 actually is the year I was born. And um, Around 87 is when I left my reserve, 86, 87. And uh, I started to see um, what was going on outside of my reserve. And one of the big things that caught my eye was uh, me witnessing hip hop culture for the first time. And uh, being part of the, being, being from a nation that's, um, you know, doesn't really, um, it, it like, Western culture and my culture, it's if you could imagine Western culture is like a one way street and uh, it's going like, you know, it's going south and my culture would be on that same street, but going north. <laughs> so there was a lot of conflict growing up with uh, understanding what was going on around me and trying to make sense of it. And for so many different things, I wasn't willing to compromise my values, my language, my way of life for what you know what the pressure was for me to fit in the norm and uh the only thing that i could gravitate to where i could fit in where i could get positive attention and contribute was the art forms and hip-hop i started break dancing at a really young age um most of you may know it as break dancing the way i was raised with it it's called b-boying or b-girling and um, i immediately gravitated to all the art forms and hip-hop in hip hop, they have B boys and B girls. They have MCs or rappers. They have DJs and they have graffiti writers. Well, in my culture, we have something called a powwow, and at the powwow ceremonies, we have all of those things intact. Our drummers would be considered the DJs. Um, our storytellers would be considered the MCs or the rappers. Uh, our rock uh, painters, our our wood carvers, or our um, cedar scroll writers that would all be considered to be like graffiti artists. Um, and our dancers, the B-boys and B-girls, well, we have powwow dancers, all types of dancers. So, so many different categories of dancing. And essentially what a powwow means is celebrating life. <clears throat> and that's kind of the idea of what I got when I started to witness hip hop culture outside in the parks and just really gravitated to the fact that I could fit in, I can contribute and I didn't have to compromise my culture. So fast forward now uh, into my young uh, adult years and my young early 20s, um, I made quite a name for myself in the hip hop community. I have uh, uh, strong influences and ties and, and a bond with uh, the pioneers of this culture. See, when I was growing up, I had 
taken the approach, the similar approach of how I would approach elders in my community to learn, I approached what I was calling my elders in hip hop the same way. And I showed them a lot of respect and, uh, and the, the, the eagerness to learn. And so I sought out mentors and got accepted by some uh, pioneers within the culture. And uh, I was groomed and, uh, and essentially I was passed the torch. I was given the torch of the, the essential uh, initial meaning behind of what hip hop is supposed to be. And uh, I was actually the first uh, native ever to be put down with um, the Zulu Kings. And the Zulu Kings is actually the first B-boy crew ever in the Bronx that came out of New York. And uh, it's quite an honor to be part of that lineage. And um, I became a member in 2000, the year 2000. And um, three years before that, I became a member of a crew called Ready to Rock. Both of these crews are from the Bronx. And I spent a lot of time in New York learning the culture, participating, battling people, making a name for myself, earning a reputation, um, the way that I was taught. <clears throat> and uh, I, I made a really, really good name for myself in the underground scene. I had battled every name out there, battled with um, alongside with some of the legends in the game. And, um, and uh, I held my own. And in a lot of cases, I evolved this dance. I evolved this culture in the underground. And um, so I had been grooming myself as a hip hop artist. And uh, I learned how to uh, later on make a career out of it. And um, I've been fortunate that I've been able to travel all over the world and teach other people breaking and teach them about hip hop culture and teach them a lot about, um, you know, just the, 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 the foundation that I was given. And uh, I take it really serious to be able to share and pass on, um, you know, the, the, these approaches that were trusted in me, a, a foreigner, because I'm not from the Bronx. And essentially what happened to me never really happened to anyone else before or after. Um, I was given um, access to people that normally wouldn't talk to anyone, but because of who I was affiliated with and who was vouching for me saying, hey, that's my nephew, go teach him. Um, you know, hip hop culture in New York, it comes from gang culture. And um, although hip hop is an alternative to avoid violence and have a positive uh, way to express yourself, it still comes from a city that's pretty much fully drenched in gang culture. And so the reason why I gravitated to hip hop so much is because I made the choice at a young age that I didn't want to be in a gang. I rather would be in a crew. And being part of a crew, I would get the same respect as I would if I were to be an outlaw or if I would have joined a gang. I got the same respect. And um, it's uh, something that I was never interested in being part of a, a gang. I was only interested in being part of a dance crew. Uh, another thing I think that I should mention that's really important is um, I was a single father at the age of 17. I, um, I was uh, essentially responsible to raise my son by myself, and um, I didn't get any help or any support from anyone. So that was another reason why I chose hip hop as, uh, as a way to express myself and as, as a community to get involved in is because to me, hip hop was super positive and everything else that was around me that a lot of my friends were involved in was very negative. And it was like a path of destruction that I didn't want to be volunteering to be a part of. Um, so I, um, I, I did my best as a, as a single father could do, um, and just, you know, try to set the example and be very inspiring towards my son and, and involve him in everything I was doing and essentially groom him into the culture as well. And, and, um, so that was a really like big part of my story is that the heavy influence of hip hop culture coming into my life at a young age and me finding a place that I belong in. Um, so after I made a name for myself in hip hop, I continued to contribute and evolve with the culture and help to help the culture evolve by doing some things that weren't very common practices. And one of the things that I did is I taught my style to everybody. And that was something that was really rare. No one ever really had done that 
if, if you teach your style to other people um, in some perspectives of the culture, you're giving away your, the essence of your originality. And uh, for me, it was never um, something that I owned. It was something that was given to me and I always felt that I needed to give it back one day. And so after I had reached a, you know, tremendous amounts of success in the underground world of hip hop, I felt like I had no other choice but to give everything back because I had taken everything up until that point and it was receiving benefits. And, and uh, I felt like that was the turning point I needed to acknowledge that, okay, I'm here. I made it here through these, I made it, I'm still, you know, I'm still doing these things. And it's important that I set an example and I start to give back, you know, all these gifts and these gems that I was given. So now that you kind of have a background of my hip hop, um, and that's a really, really very fast forward version of the story. But um, I just wanted you to understand that hip hop, it's still part of the root, my roots. It's part of my foundation. Um, so I started to, um, you know, like I've always, I've done all the art forms in hip hop. So I'm a, I'm a B-boy, I'm a DJ, I'm an MC, and I'm a writer. So graffiti writer. And I do all the art forms and um, I've made music. I've made albums. Um, I've been part of some pretty amazing projects. And um, I've had a roller coaster lifestyle that's been really hot, some crazy highs and crazy lows. But it was really just an amazing overall experience that has brought me here today. Um, so how I got here is actually quite new. And it's quite, uh, it, it's been a trajectory in my career as a muralist. I've uh, only been painting murals for the past four years. Um, when I started, I had a graffiti background, but uh, I wanted to learn more. Um, I felt like I had reached uh, some boundaries I had created for myself just by being self-taught a little too much. And uh, so what I did is I, I sought out some mentors, friends that I've always, you know, looked up to as artists. And um, my first mentor, his name is Alexander Bacon. And um, Alex is an amazing guy. I met him in 1999. And uh, what's funny about our relationship is when we met each other, um, he was like, you know, the king of Toronto for graffiti. And I was, you know, doing my thing in hip hop and breaking. And we shared very similar roles and responsibilities where we were both setting trends. We were both setting the standards in our art forms. And at that time, I was heavily um, focusing on breaking and emceeing. And graffiti was always there. And DJing was always there. But my main, main focus was was b-boying. And, um, and DJing was, you know, part of it. But I wanted to really stand out and set new standards for breaking. And uh, I'm a growing up um, Anishinaabe, I was very heavily involved in powwows. And um, from a young age, I started grass dancing. And uh, grass dancing is one of the uh, traditional powwow dances. Uh, I started to mix my grass dancing with breaking. And I started to like mix a lot of my culture's influences and approaches to art with hip hop. And I found like the relationship, the marriage was, was like, it was so smooth and easy. I was just like, whoa, this is crazy. And so I started to teach my friends and my crew. It started there. And um, my crew started to get a lot of uh, recognition in battles for our original uh, styles that we were bringing out and all those routines that they were doing were the routines that I had made up and I originally made them up with one of my friends his name is Floor Phantom and uh, Phantom and me and Phantom grew I knew Phantom since he was 14 in the Bronx and his mom is actually the first original b-girl um, her name was Lulu and um, her older brother is Pop Master Fable and Fable and Lulu were the ones who kind of first adopted me into like their families because they saw me playing and they saw me chilling in New York and I was by myself a lot and I was a kid and they were just like, what are you doing out here? This is crazy. You shouldn't be out here by yourself, especially if you're not from here. But um, I was very persistent and uh, I think they just felt like it was 
you know, it was their kind of like res responsibility in a way to like look out for me. And um, so I had met my brother Phantom and we grew up with each other and um, we started to like want to evolve the dance. We didn't want to look like our teachers anymore. Our found our our mentors were starting to kind of um, not all of them, but some of them were, I felt like they were trying to control us. And so at that age, uh, this is like when I was around 18, 17, um, we really wanted to put our stamp on the culture. And so we started to evolve things by mixing things that you normally wouldn't mix. And we invented this whole new style. And um, when we started to compete with this style, uh, the whole world gravitated towards it to the point now where everyone does our style as their foundation, which is it's a tremendous honor to be a part of this history. And uh, it's not just solely me. It was a, it was a it was a collective of of contributions from my crew ready to rock and how we were able to um, essentially take the foundation, flip it and add native powwow dancing to it. And I was the source for that influence of the native powwow steps. And uh, not only the powwow steps, but the stories behind the steps and explaining the mentality of why I moved the way that I moved and the different animals that I used in my dances and how they influenced me. And, and um, it played a huge role in our success in terms of our contribution to the culture, the overall culture and the underground scene. And uh, I'm still living off of some of those benefits. I still get invited to go all over the world to teach and share and judge events and do workshops and, and um, you know, do like uh, do a lot of different things based off of like the art forms that I, that I do. But um, I got to a point where I really wanted to focus on something more positive than what I was seeing in, in the hip hop world. I was starting to lose a lot of the, my passion for the scene. I love the art forms, but the competitive side of what hip hop was turning into was like a sports game. And I was, I was never into hip hop because of the sports side of competing with people. It was all about being an individual to me, being original and contributing in a way where, you know, you were a one, one man army or a one, a one, you know, the one show pony kind of thing. I wanted to like create uh, an impact where I gained my reputation solely by myself. And the, my crew was all like that too. We all wanted to stand out as individuals, not just as a, as a group. And um, I had, uh, I'd kind of like reached my, I had been number one in hip hop in the underground scene for a very long time. And it was one of the loneliest things in my life. Like I was, I had competed with everyone and, and I don't know if you've ever seen a battle in hip hop, but like when you battle somebody, it's not, this is unlike any other art forms that are out there. Michelangelo pull up to Picasso's, uh, you know, stu studio and be like, let's battle. Let's see who's a better painter. <laughs> but in the art forms that I grew up in, I was very much part of the culture. And, um, you know, I had battled a lot of people and, and uh, I noticed that, like, you know, like the respect that I thought I was going to get, I thought it was going to be a lot different than what it, what, what it really became. And um, I just noticed that um, I wasn't interested anymore in competing. I wasn't interested anymore in battling people. I had nothing to prove to anyone. I had trade styles that everyone started doing. So I was just like, well, what do I do next? What, what, what's, what's part of my, what's going to be part of this next chapter? Because I was no longer interested in, and um, continuing the direction that I was heading with hip hop. And so I sought out a, a mentor and his name is uh, Alexander Bacon. And, and I asked him, I was like, you know, I was like, I really want to learn how to paint murals. Like, I really want to learn how to, I need to, I need to level up in my skills. And my brother was like, yo, no problem. I got you. He's like, yo, cause I, I used to teach him breaking in the nineties. When we first met, I was teaching him how to top rock and teaching him my style the same way that I had done it for years and years with everyone else. And um, he always really appreciated that I did that. And uh, so when the favor was asked to be returned, he was, he didn't hesitate. And uh, within a few months, he had me painting my first mural with him. And um, so this is where my style is kind of like where it was 
created was I asked my brother to teach me how to paint murals. And he literally showed me everything that what it takes to do a mural from beginning to end. And um, I never even, I, I couldn't even believe the first mural after it was done. It was like I was looking at something and I couldn't believe that I had contributed to it. I was like, this is crazy. And it was, it was uh, definitely something I wasn't used to, but super interested in from that point on. I was, it's all I could think of. Um, so I started painting murals roughly four years ago. So the style that I do is a contribution of the way I was, the way I was taught to share um, the art that I was, that comes from my community and um, which is Nipissing or Nibesing and, um, and mix it with hip hop and the influences of hip hop. So I had learned how to paint using spray cans and um, I really wanted to try and do what was, I was learning as the woodland style. But uh, after I started to study that term, I realized that that wasn't really a correct term. It wasn't accurate. Um, I guess the most accurate term of what the style that I do from my indigenous side of me is the Nipissing Anishinaabe uh, way of sharing stories. So in my culture, because we don't have a written language, everything is passed on through oral teachings. Um, majority of them are actually songs, the beautiful songs. And I remember my nokamis, my grandmother, when I was young, teaching me our language through singing. And um, it's always a beautiful memory for me to remember those. It's almost like nursery rhymes in a way, but they're teaching me my language through singing. And uh, it was my grandmother, my uncle Albert, which was her brother, and my great aunt, um, uh, Martha. And um, they were all always really positive in my lifestyles, role models. And um, I was just really grateful that I was able to live around them and hear them talk in Anishinaabe Moen and listen to their conversations and get the teachings that they were explaining to me. So I learned a lot of my culture through art, through like images that you're, similar images that you're seeing here. And um, a lot of the artwork that we have in uh, the Anishinaabe culture from the way I was taught is sacred geometry and these sacred geometry patterns are affiliated to uh, a lot of different things so for example above the um the bear uh on the uh on the screen you're gonna see a it's like it looks like two circles a black circle that's like a silhouette with a bunch of red dots in this and then in the middle of it there is a blue circle and then above that blue circle is a red circle again and so um, I was taught about uh, some of, uh, ways to show, show and share our, our teachings through these shapes. And so these are shapes that I actually took from my community when I was young, um, from my brothers, from my un cousins, uncles, you know, different family members who were artists. And I always had a lot of questions and asked, you know, what does this mean? So that symbol right there with the four um, looks like a kind of like a cardinal compass. It's that's actually called a medicine wheel. And the way I drew it here isn't a traditional way. Um, it's more of a modern style. And I tried to include um, different layers of teachings with the medicine wheel itself. So in the background behind the, um, the shape of the circle, there's actually seven different uh, tones of colors uh, of going from like dark orange to uh, like yellow. And if you look to the right where you see the sun, uh, there's also a representation of seven rings that come out from the center of that su the sun. And that represents the seven grandfather teachings. Um, the four directions of the medicine wheel uh, have multiple purposes and teachings and layers. So it, it, it could mean the cardinal compass it could also uh, represent the four elements of earth. So earth, wind, water, fire. It also could represent the four seasons. Um, so spring, summer, fall, and winter. It could also represent the four colors of humanity, the yellow nation, the red nation, the black nation, and the white nation. It also represents the four natures in humanity. So it represents your spirit, represents your emotions, represents your body, and it represents your mind. Those are just some of the layers. And um, I'm sure as you can start to hear, there's a, a lot of layering processes within our painting styles. And 
when you learn to understand the geometry and the patterns and you start to see the teachings and the teachings come out in layers. Um, so in the bear itself, you'll see that the bear represents, uh, it has like, it's, I, uh, I don't know how to explain that, but it's meant to be the same thing on both sides, but opposites. And um, those are teachings of the polarity teachings or duality teachings of all life, the masculine and femininity of all life that exists on Turtle Island. And uh, the bear represents, um, Makwa is a medicine clan. And uh, the bear is the only nation that actually communicates to all of the six nations. Um, the bear is uh, a powerful symbol within the Anishinaabe culture. Um, and and it has a heavy influence in our creation stories. Um, and the well, the way I wanted the bear to, to, to be represented was sitting on the back of Turtle Island. And uh, I drew this turtle um, to represent, uh, you know, the, the, the story of Turtle Island and, and how we were essentially, uh, how the Anishinaabe people began living here. Um, I didn't include the, the original story of it. What I did is I just wanted to show the sim symbolism of the turtle that we're here in North America is Turtle Island. And uh, I included the six nations of Turtle Island. So the six nations here is that you see the butterflies that are to the left of me. Um, that represents the, uh, the insect nation. And uh, then you have the fish nation. Um, and then you have the animal nation represented by the, the bear. And you have the, uh, the silhouettes. There's, there's, you'll see uh, these two silhouettes. Um, one's kind of going straight up. And yeah, they both have what looks like it could be like ears or it could be feathers. And those are representation of Nana Bojo. And um, the two first spirits that ever came to Turtle Island were Nana Bojo and Makwa. And I wanted to share that story of how uh, Makwa became a bear before, because Makwa and Nana Bush were similar uh, entities. But um, there's a beautiful story about how they kind of like balanced each other. One was kind of like up to mischief and the other one was always going behind the other, cleaning up their mess. And um, so there's a lot of layers and stories and teachings and um, so I, I decided to do is mesh the graffiti background of how I draw and paint and how I do things and mix it in with the traditional way of storytelling that I was raised to, to do. And so uh, the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the, uh, the representation of the loon family. And uh, where I'm from, there's lots of loons and uh, it's a heavy influence on, on me. There's stories of the loons and, and uh, I've always gravitated towards actually the first symbol I was ever taught to draw as a silhouette was a, a picture of a horizon on the water and some loons um, swimming into um, like into the shoreline. And uh, so the bird nation is the representation uh, is represented here in this uh, as well. And the six nations, if you're not familiar with them, uh, is the uh, there's before the human nation ever came to Turtle Island, five nations had to agree to let us live here and become our teachers. And those five nations were the insect nation the plant nation. And uh, the plant nation is also inside the bear's knees. You can see that there's two flowers um, kind of like coming out. Uh, and uh, there's also the bird nation. There's the, the animal nation. Wait, let me start over again because I'm not used to talking about it so much. So it's the insect nation, the plant nation, the bird nation, the fish nation, and the animal nation. And those five nations uh, all agreed to be our teacher. And then the human nation became the sixth nation that joined last here on Turtle Island. Um, so there's a lot of layers in the symbolism here, but I'll just continue on with the slides and move on to the next, um, the next one, please. Uh, this is a, a mural I did with Street Art Toronto. And uh, this is a, an honoring mural of both my father and my mother. It was the first time I had ever drawn portraits and you'll see a, a, there's a consistency in my style. I'm always including Nana Bojo. I'm always including the duality teachings or the polarity teachings. I'm always including the seven grandfather teachings. I'm always including the medicine wheel teachings. And I try to sneak in other ones as well. There's something called the 13 grandmother clan system. And essentially that's like the lunar calendar for the Anishinaabe people. We follow the 13 full moons per year. Uh, that's 28 days per moon in between each full moon. And that equals a total of 364 days a year. 
And on the very last day, we rest, and then we begin the process again following our grandmother clan system. So when you're looking at a lot of my paintings, um, I include a lot of that geometry through shapes and colors. Um, I like rings. I like the vibration of rings and what that symbolizes. I use a lot of circles in my culture because I've, I was taught a, a way of thinking called circular thinking, and that's through using the medicine wheel, uh, understanding the, the way that nature is working around me and the direction that it's going, how, where it starts. And um, if you're ever interested in learning about that type of stuff, um, I can give you a really quick, brief uh, explanation. Every day here where we're living on this uh, in Toronto, um, the sun starts in the east. And essentially, the sun is giving you your guide of where you should go next and, um, and the pattern that it's creating with that circular distance that it travels. So when the sun rises in the east, um, it, to us during noon, it's actually going to be south of us. If you look straight up at the midday sun, which is called Nakwe Gijik, um, you, you'll notice that it's just south of you. And so uh, after it reaches, uh, after it goes to the midday sun, Nakwe Gijik then goes to the west direction, which is going to be the sunset. And then from there, um, overnight, it's going to be in the north. It actually goes north of us. And if we were able to see through the planet, through the earth, um, it would be like same way when we looked at the sun looking straight up. It was uh, north of it was uh, south of us. When we wait, when we would be sleeping, it would be north of us. And so the sun is showing us a circular pattern of how it's how nature is working in the environment that we're in right now. And so. I was raised to always keep myself in harmony and balance by uh, observing the sun and, and paying attention to Nokomis, Grandmother Moon, and uh, harmonizing myself by also putting myself into my own natures and using circular thinking. Um, so this was a, a really cool project for me because I actually got to paint this with my son and my daughter. And... Um, I've ha I just I've been blown away with the uh, the 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 experience of being able it it, it kind of like it's surreal when I paint with my my son and my daughter it's it's such a cool experience because I've I you know I just I love to include them in these types of things and and it's just it really brings us closer together and the day that we actually painted my mom it was her birthday um, and uh, we painted it and I. I ended up doing that one section of the wall in one day with the help of my son and my daughter, of course. And um, yeah, it was, it turned out really nice. This is a picture of my mom when she was 22. And um, I, a one thing about the woodland style that um, helps make sense of what you're seeing when you uh, understand what I'm trying to paint. And Norvell Morceau, he really coined this phrase well when he said, if you could imagine an x-ray photo of spirit, that's what we're trying to paint. And uh, essentially, that's exactly what, you know, I like to share. I, I like to give that explanation of what, what it is that people are seeing. It's what you're seeing here is energy and spirit. And um, my father was a medicine man or a healer. And um, he's, he had a tremendous uh, impact on the community. Um, he introduced our culture to a lot of Native people that had never experienced anything about our culture before. And uh, my father was a bit of... Um, a renaissance man in a way where he did a lot he wore a lot of hats but um he also went against a lot of the elders that um basically were telling him that what he was doing he shouldn't do it and he should stop sharing these teachings and these medicines with the people that he was sharing it with what my father ended up doing is he went to a lot of the penitentiaries across canada and he went in there to basically teach the inmates our culture. And he did sweat lodges. He did sacred fires. And essentially him and Vern Harper just went like around uh, all across Turtle Island. And, and they introduced our culture to, to a lot of uh, native inmates that are uh, in the penitentiaries across Canada. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with the problem with the native inmate population in prisons, it's quite alarming when you... Uh, hear the statistics, but native population of Canada is only 2% of the actual population, yet we make over 50% of the population of the prisons across Canada. 
So more than 50% of the population of the inmates in the penitentiaries across Canada are Native people, but we are only 2% of the population of the actual overall you know, country. And um, so there's uh, a lot of things that both my parents did that I was really proud of. My mother is also an elder, and um, she's dedicated her whole life to helping other people. And she's a very unselfish person. And I learned a lot from her, observing her. She's my main teacher and uh, my hero in life. And um, I'm super, super grateful that my mom made made me <laughs> and um, and uh, that she was alive to pass on called the, our teachings to me and share with me what she has been. And she's still here to celebrate with me these victories that I've been uh, achieving throughout my life. And it's uh, my father's been, he's passed on to the spirit world now. But um, if you're ever interested in seeing my father, there's a documentary about him through the National Film Board of Canada. You can go onto the nfb.ca website. And if you type in spirit within, you'll be able to watch a documentary that uh, gets into the details of what I was just sharing about my father going to the penitentiaries and, and, and sharing our culture with the inmates. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, this was a project uh, that um, my mentor, Alex, he invited me to Sault Ste. Marie to um, paint abstract um, indigenous art. <laughs> and this was my first time ever trying this um multiple layers of 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 different um symbols and shapes um here you can see the moon and the sun kind of overlapping each other but also kind of the the showing like um it's not meant to be like perfect this is meant to be like just like very fluent but showing flow in 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 all the different things that you can see and can't see that are connected to each other um, I always include my signature Nana Bojo characters. And um, this was a really fun uh, mural I painted with my brother uh, Bacon and also another artist by the name of Peru, um, who's a South American indigenous person. So in my culture, uh, the Red Nation is both North America and South America. So it was like, um, you know, just a, it's like painting with one of my relatives. <laughs> a lot of fun. And um, this one was um, a, definitely a new style for me I had never done before. And I just painted this. All the paintings that I'm going to show you, they were all done um, this summer, I think, except for the last two near the end. But um, this was done, I think, in either June I did this one or I did it in May. But we can go to the next, please. This is the, the, the overall effect of it. So um, me and Bacon, Bacon uh, did the... the uh, the uh, red tail hawk on the right and uh, I did the symbols on the left side here and then we kind of all helped out my friend Peru and um, the word it says Bindigen which means welcome in Anishinaabe and uh, Sault Ste. Marie was actually before one of our one of the central cities of the Anishinaabe people like it was the center of our nation and uh, there was a city of about two million Anishinaabe people before the whole colonial process began and um, it's quite sacred lands there. And all, all of it is sacred. But for the Anishinaabe people, this was the center of our nation. So it was really cool and honoring experience to, to go to Sault Ste. Marie and paint this mural with my mentor and another amazing artist. And uh, I was just, uh, overall, I was just, you know, I was super excited and honored to be part of this project. This is a really large mural too for us. Like, and we only paint, it took us only four days to do this mural. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Here is, uh, I didn't want to put this one up, but I really like the bear and the wolf, but I look crazy in this one. I look like I just woke up on the side there. <laughs> but uh, this was just a commission I did. Um, this was actually mostly influenced by the owner of the building. He had specific wants and um, he mentioned all of these things and I just drew it for him essentially. But uh, this was a commission I did in the beginning of the year. And uh, this was my first outdoor mural for this year, this season. I think I did this one in the beginning of May. We can move to the next one. It's just another view. Um, so this was like, a, I, I provided a few work in, progress shots here. I am at the St. Lawrence Arts Center doing a visual land acknowledgement. 
And um, this was a really cool project. I actually painted this whole thing by myself in four days and um, really, really uh, challenging mural. Um, this was on vinyl. It was made on a sub wall. And uh, there was two really crazy factors. The first one was that lift that you see me on uh, that rocked back and forth the entire time I was on it because the sidewalk is on an angle. And also the wind would blow the, the vinyl like, like waves. And so I was literally moving back and forth on, I felt like I was on a boat. <laughs> I really felt like I was painting on a boat. It was crazy. But um, I ended up getting the job done. We can switch to the next. Here's uh, the bottom panel when I finished it up. It was amazing. This, this mural was quite unique where the client actually said, can you do some graffiti on <laughs> the billboard? And I was so shocked because in the beginning, my initial design didn't have anything like this. It was completely different. And um, because the way that they had to make the sub the walls, they couldn't join them together for some reason. So they had two billboards instead of one. There was supposed to just be one big billboard. So I kind of like scrunched my original design into the top portion of the billboard and the bottom. They just said, freestyle it, do whatever you want. And uh, so I did a self-portrait of myself uh, emceeing. And, uh, you know, this is my background is graffiti. You know, I grew up painting trains and just being part of that culture. And, and uh, I've always loved the uh, just painting my name, painting letters. You know, I, I love painting letters. It's such a, one of the things that, uh, that I was taught at a young age that really made me like graffiti was one of my mentors told me that if I wanted to do graffiti, what I had to do was learn how to make my letters dance. And uh, that always stood out to me a lot to try and do and I always try to take that challenge on. Um, we can move on to the next, please. So this is the overall picture of when it's done. Here you'll see a representation of some of the geometry patterns I was mentioning. You can see the seven rings and the sun on the top left-hand side. You'll see the uh, silhouettes of Nana Bojo in the background. Um, there's actually meaning behind every single shape on this one. The seven grandfather teachings are included in this. The 13 grandmother clan system is included in this. Um, so essentially, this is a lunar calendar, if you know how to read it. Um, I included uh, a lot of stories about the, uh, the creation story. I included, um, again, the six nations, the, the bird nation, the fish nation, the insect nation, the animal nation, um, the plant nation. And um, I also included the turtle island story. Um, and uh, Grandmother Moon and how th that influences us with the calendar. And at the bottom of the mural, I made a, a statement. This mural was created with one of my uh, mentees. I've been uh, fortunate enough where other artists asked me to teach them, which I think is cool. And um, so I've always taken those roles very serious. When someone asks me to share, I, I try my best to share with them everything. Um, and so they actually, uh, I asked them to draw a character, a portrait of me. And um, the, uh, the artist who helped me out on this, her name is Sadie Marshall. She's now, uh, her, she's a, a muralist in her own now, right? She's doing her own projects. Uh, this summer, she, she had some amazing solo projects that I was able to, um, to, uh, to witness myself. And it's amazing to watch someone, you know, jump leaps and bounds and, um, you know, do things that they might have doubted that they couldn't do before and just own it and like, you know, really uh, live up to, um, you know, the, the hype uh, that, uh, <laughs> that they were, you know, that they were tailored into. But uh, you can skip to the next, um, the next photo. So here it says, in honor of all the missing and murdered Indigenous people of Turtle Island. And um, the character that's on the left, that's, uh, that's me with my dog, Mayen Gun. And um, I'm from the Mayen Gun Dotum, which is the wolf clan. And I have a husky at home who's half husky, half chocolate lab. And um, I named him Mayen Gun. And, and so the, my, my mentee, I asked her to like just draw whatever she wanted to contribute on the wall. And so she drew me with my dog in my hood, like a Charlie Brown kind of style. And um, I thought that was just really cool. And she's like blown away that she was like, I even asked her to do this. And um, yeah, it was a really, really, really cool experience between us and super grateful that uh, she helped me out. 
And um, I couldn't have done this project without her. And um, yeah, this was also a, a, a really important mural project because of what it symbolized to me. I wanted to create, and, and a lot of my paintings, I'm trying to accomplish this. I'd, I'm, what I'm trying to do is create a visual healing or visual learning experience. And um, uh, I feel like, you know, when I paint, it's my role and my responsibility to tell the stories that I learned in full, like tell the truth, tell those stories, honor those stories um, so that uh, they're never forgotten. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this project here was insane. This was my first solo project. <laughs> and uh, it took me eight days to paint this project. My mentor, you can see on the right side, Bacon, he did his uh, signature hyper realism and uh, he painted a red tail hawk. In case you're wondering why he keeps painting red tail hawks, one of my spirit guides is a red tail hawk. And I had told him that a long time ago. And um, he always draws one for me whenever we're painting a project together. Uh, one thing I would like to, um, to say about this is that uh, I was introduced to the architect um, firm this year um, for the launching of this building. It was finally opened up and, um, and I got a chance to, uh, to meet some people from Toronto, like John Tory and other um, people that are, uh, the, I, I, for, I forget her name, but she's the, um, she's, part, she's the main person for the Ministry of Transportation for the city. And um, she was there and I'm not good with names and, I'm not really good with titles, but um, it was all important people. And uh, the architect came up to me and was like, are you the artist? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, I just wanted to let you know that our firm won architecture, the, uh, arch the building of the year, or what, I guess, award for this building in particular. And uh, they said that the panelists, um, when choosing which building, uh, which firm would win this, this uh, annual competition, um, one of the factors that they chose, the reason why they chose this building was because they thought that the murals, the mural was actually influenced by the architecture, by the architects. And um, so that was one of the main reasons was because of the way that the mural uh, complemented the architecture was one of the reasons why they won architect, um, I don't know, whatever the award is that they win for you know, making the dopest building in the, in the city. <laughs> so uh, that was a really cool thing to hear. I had no idea that, you know, that was even a possibility, but um, yeah, that was, I thought that was really dope. This is also another visual land acknowledgement. Um, I was kind of like on that theme for a bit. I really wanted to, I, I hear a lot of people doing the land acknowledgements before their meetings and it only make, it only mentions the human nation. And um, in my culture, like, uh, the Anishinaabe way of life, uh, nature is first, the laws of nature come first, and uh, humans are privileged guests here, so we don't really get to put ourselves ahead of nature ever, and so I thought it'd be a good idea to, to share this story, the way I was taught about land acknowledgements, and uh, I created a few murals with that theme around the city, and um, this was one of my favorite projects. Uh, I had two of my mentor, mentees uh, part of this project, my mentor came and joined and he did the red tail hawk for me. And my son was actually part of this project too. And he came by and helped me with some filming and some editing and uh, just the overall, like he contributed to every step of the way. Um, and we can uh, move to the, uh, the next one, please. So this is the uh, TTC uh, ride guide maps that you might've seen if any of you ride the subway. Um, I created this for them to, um, help share those medicine wheel teachings. And here you can see some of the layers I was mentioning and where they go. And um, I was raised uh, with my Anishinaabe culture, but I was also raised with my Odawa culture. And Odawa is part of the Anishinaabe, um, the seven, the seven um, confederacy, I forget how to say it in English, but there's seven nations in my Anishinaabe tribe. And one of them is, um, is the uh, Odawa. And if you're familiar with uh, the petroglyphs in Peterborough, that was my ancestors that did that, that created those, those uh, amazing uh, petroglyphs that are in the stones there. And um, so I included the, uh, the Odawa medicine wheel at the bottom. And then the top, uh, top left is the seven grandfather teachings, which also represents um, the sun. 
And then on the right where it's connected, it shows like the yellow, red, black, and white circle. That's a representation of the moon. And it's also a representation of the medicine wheel. And um, just showing um, different layers of how they connect and, and trying to make it so that it's like very much an educational kind of piece of art. Um, this was something that um, I just, I, it blows me away. I, I went from painting subway maps. You know, it's funny, it's like about four years ago when I used to travel around, one of my biggest requests was to get uh, subway maps and to write people's names in the subway map in graffiti. And um, so I used to do that and I used to sell like tons of maps all the time. <laughs> and I went from, you know, painting on these maps to now like being on the cover. So it's a crazy, surreal experience. Uh, this year was, uh, the whole year was like that for me. Um, but yeah, can we please go to the next slide? Uh, this was a uh, mural I had done to honor the uh, frontline um, workers when uh, COVID first struck. And um, I had just um, kind of like come home from a, a, an amazing trip in Asia. And uh, I remember I returned February 26th from Japan. And uh, March 8th is when the lockdown began. And um, I was stuck at home, like in the lockdown, the quarantine, like everyone else. And uh, Street Art Toronto had put out a call for... Um, something called Just Us. And the Just Us call was for artists who wanted to contribute to uh, the front, show a, tr a tribute to the frontline workers. And so what I have done here is I included the um, 13 full moons and all of her names. Um, so it starts off with um, uh, talks with relations, uh, then wisdom keeper, and then weighs the truth, looks far woman, listening woman, storyteller, loves all things, she who heals, setting sun woman, weaves the web, walks tall woman, gives praise, and then becomes her vision. And that's the last moon of the year. And then it starts over again. And th these are the names of the Anish that the Anishinaabe people have given to our Nokamis, our grandmother. And, um, also, I wanted to honor the uh, this territory, this treaty number 13 territory of Toronto. Um, this is a really cool project. Uh, my cousin was part of a tribe called Red, and he's really good friends with uh, George Strombo. And this is actually on George Strombo's house. He, um, he allowed me to, uh, to paint on here and he got in contact with his neighbors and they allowed me access to the back part of the Queen's Alley. And um, yeah, this is a really... Uh, a really surreal project to be part of as well because the way it unfolded and how everything happened. Um, we can move to the next. Um, this is the first mural I ever did in the city. This is with my brother Bacon. After I did this, I couldn't, I still like, I still look at it and be like, damn, how, like, I can't believe I did that. Like it's, uh, it's a really cool feeling to put a painting up in the city that doesn't get trashed or vandalized or painted over or buffed and um, to be able to share my culture and um, share a piece of myself was something that uh, it's uh, it, to me, it's a really, it's a real big honor. It's uh, something that I'm never going to um, downplay and act like it's, you know, not as important as it is to me because this was part of my healing journey, essentially to change a lot of different things that I wanted to remove from my life that I felt were dysfunctional and remove and replace those with healthy, um, healthy routines and painting murals I, has really put me onto a real positive track with my life and super grateful for Street Art Toronto for being so supportive for me to, to have these spaces where I can create and share and feel like I'm contributing to my city to make it a better place. Um, so we can slide the next slide, please. Um, these are more uh, mural projects that uh, I've done through Street Art Toronto, um, different shapes, different symbols, um, all based off of geometry. Um, this is the otter clan on the right, and then on the left is the sturgeon, uh, which is a, a bottom feeder, but a, a really, really cool fish. If you've ever seen a sturgeon, it looks like a shark, essentially, so they're super scary but um, they don't have any teeth. <laughs> so the most that they'll do is suck your toes. But um, yeah, they're uh, really cool prehistoric looking fish and I've always wanted to paint them and 
Um, this was a project I did also with my friend uh, Alex again. He's been um, a huge influence on me and um, just a really an amazing teacher. He always wants to include me in projects and it's, um, it's quite overwhelming experience because he's a legend and um, I just get hum. I feel so crazy inside every time he asks me to do something. I'm like, are you sure you want me? There's so many other dope artists in, but um, you just, uh, we work really well together and uh, he definitely compliments everything I do. So I'd be foolish to not paint with bacon. Um, we can move to the next slide. I think this is, uh, so this is a good example of um, what bacon has really helped me do. So this was after just a, a one year of painting and um, everything on the left side of the, uh, the blackbird is, is my art and everything on the right side is his. And um, he just was, he just gave me some creative control on this one and said, just do what you're, do what you want to do here. You know, just, you know, and he gave me, um, he gave me a lesson about color theory. And um, ever since then, I've applied those teachings to all my pieces. And um, this was a piece that really made me believe in I can do anything. And this is at the uh, Lawrence West. It's a uh, Lawrence West and Weston Road underpass where the GO train is. And uh, it's also the up, I think it's the up line where you can take the, um, take the train to the uh, airport as well. To the next slide, please. It's a little close up of it. Here is uh, the opposite side of that same street on Lawrence. I, we painted murals along the entire underpass going both sides. Um, and uh, this was uh, some more teachings of the Turtle Island teachings, the different animals, the fish nation, the bird nation. And uh, we went through all the nations on both sides. We can go to the next slide, please. And um, le to the left-hand side is my friend Alex style. He's got this very unique abstract um, uh, style that he's um, signature, like he's a signature, it's a, definitely a signature to him. And um, we just kind of like had a cool way of meshing our styles together. And he did the uh, spotted trout on the right side. And then I did the trout, my version of it on the left side. And um, yeah, it was just really cool how they, how it turned out. Go to the next slide, please. So this is the proposal that I had submitted for the installation that is going up right now. And um, when I initially thought about this project, I wasn't even sure that I could do it. I was kind of like a bit intimidated by the, um, the installation process. I had no idea how I could do anything on window but I was encouraged to set a proposal and um, I had just finished a project at the Hart Park for the University of Toronto. And um, it was my first political piece where I had done a bunch of silhouettes of children lined up, like as if they were going to their first day of school and they were all excited and it's just the black silhouettes of them. So you can't really see the details of them, but you can tell that they're excited you can tell that they're anxious and they're all dressed up like it's their first day of school and essentially what i did is i made like a profile like a, a lineup and the all the all the young people are in the lineup and it starts off with kindergarten and it goes all the way to university students and um instead of these students going to school um they're going to the spirit world because these are the school, these are the first students to the residential schools. And um, I really wanted to um, kind of create this image where people were looking at it and like, you know, they would, they would feel really good about it, but I was, I wanted them to question what they were looking at. And once they got the answer, um, I felt like it would create a, conversation that really is needed to be this, especially on the campus and the university where you have all these future minds that'll be uh influencers uh, on society one day if they haven't been already and i just felt like it was an appropriate place to put this statement and so i had just finished that piece when i was approached to uh contribute and 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 um and uh, apply for this this project here and contribute my proposal and so um, 
what I wanted to do was I wanted to honor the 215 children that were found, discovered at the uh, BC Kamloops, um, we call them residential schools, but essentially what they really were were concentration camps. And, um, you know, concentration camps are a very serious title when you give it that name. It, it doesn't have the same, it doesn't resonate the same as when you say residential school. When you say the word school, it kind of creates like a, 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 it gives you an idea of something that it wasn't. Those places were not schools. Um, my mom went to a residential school. She went to Spanish. My father went to a residential school. And most of my brothers and sisters actually went to a residential school called Our Lady of Soros in Sturgeon Falls, Ontario. And I was actually the last person in my family. And I, well, I'm the baby in my family. And when I was born, that stuff wasn't there anymore. Like the residential school thing had been completely removed from those communities. And um, so when I grew up and when I started going to school, I never experienced what my brothers, my siblings had experienced. But I heard the stories, you know, and I, I always was shocked that and upset. I was so angry that my family would have been, would, were treated that way just for us being Anishinaabe people. So I, it resonated to me, this call and this opportunity to share something where I wanted to create, again, a visual healing experience but I wanted to also honor the survivors of the of, of the colonial the colonization that's been happening here on Turtle Island. And there's more ways than just residential schools. There's the '60s scoop. Um, there's children's the the CSA the the children's services. Um, you know, for my, our community, they don't act the same way that they do for the people in the cities. <laughs> you know, essentially. The new, um, you know, the new residential schools are children's aid society because a lot of Native people, um, their families, they're, they're, they're taken from their families. Um, and it's uh, when you when you learn about how and why you start to see that the system is very racist towards Indigenous people, like the systematic racism that you don't see, um, you may not see them but they're definitely there and there are laws. They are real laws. So it, it is real systematic racism because it's real laws that are made to oppress native people. And um, when I first um, saw the space and I saw the windows, I really didn't know what I, I, I looked at that wall for probably two weeks. And um, uh, it was a contribution of my daughter's grandmother who shared with me a dream she had and um, I decided to like take the idea of her dream and kind of create it into an Anishinaabe story where two children were being carried on eagles' backs. And uh, eagles represent a, a very significant sacred animal in our culture because when we pray, when we use, when we do ceremony, uh, we believe that the uh, eagle carries our prayers to the Creator. And um, so this was my way of showing. Uh, our prayers as Anishinaabe people being answered by the eagles carrying our children to the creator, back into the spirit world, back to join our ancestors. On the left-hand side, you have the grandfather's son with the seven rings in the center. And on the right-hand side, you have grandmother moon, also representing the medicine wheel teachings. And uh, the, the red dots, there are exactly 200, there will be installed in the uh, installation when it's complete, 215 red dots, which will represent the 215 children that were discovered at the uh, BC Kamloops Residential School. And um, that's essentially it for the uh, building. So today, this was a photo that was taken. Um, the installation process has begun and um, it's quite overwhelming for me. Um, I'm blown away right now. I'm still, I don't know how to ex explain how, what I'm experiencing right now because it's a bunch of mixed emotions. But I'm overwhelmed with gratitude and being grateful and just super, you know, thankful to be part of this project. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about me and a bit about my art upbringing and um, try not to make it boring. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. So, Chami Gwedge, thank you for listening. And, um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you.
So Mick, Mick Butch, thank you for your uh, presentation and for sharing your incredible story, your inspiration and passion for this mural. We're so happy to have you here with us. So before we begin the q and I'd like to introduce Carolyn Taylor, project manager with the City of Toronto, Street Art Toronto, START, a proactive program that treats Toronto streets as a vital public space and aims to develop, showcase, celebrate, and increase awareness of the street art throughout Toronto. Street Art Toronto has generously supported this mural project and we thank you, we thank them for their support. Carolyn is also the founding executive director of the Word on the Street book and magazine festival and has been involved in various Toronto-based community-driven and global cultural initiatives. Bonjour and welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Elder Wabagoon, and, and, and uh, thank you, Q. We're, we're delighted. Uh, Street Art Toronto is truly uh, delighted to be partnering with you and with the Daniels Mural Project team in this uh, week of treaties recognition events. And, uh, and we're very excited for Q's, um, for Q's wonderful artwork. Q, I would say that, um, you know, I marvel whenever I listen to you talk and tell the stories of your work and see the incredible power of the work that you do. Um, it struck me in listening to you uh, this evening that yours is such a wonderful story of a generosity of spirit. Um, you know, you spoke early on in your talk about this idea of artistic skills and, and styles and, uh, you know, the, the, the gift that you have to create art as not being something that you own. And I, and I just, I've, I found that really quite um, moving and, you know, it, it connected for me to this whole idea of mentorship and the work that you do in, in mentoring others. And, uh, and also this idea that in fact, for all of us, our, our earliest mentors were the sun and the moon and insects and two-leggeds and four-leggeds. I wondered, could you um, talk for a moment about your approach to mentorship when, when you, when someone um, comes to you with a desire to be mentored uh, and you, uh, you know, you agree to take that on, um, what, what approach do you use? Um, well, I, I have a few influences. I was raised um, as a, from my Anishinaabe side about extended family being really important to share with your relatives. And essentially everyone is my relative and so it's like a role and a responsibility to share with one another. In my culture, we have uh, some things called the original instructions. And uh, there's a few of them that really stand out to me all the time. One is that one of my jobs is every day I need to learn one new thing. And another responsibility I have is to share, share what I learned. And so um, I always take that approach with me and, and I, I I use those values to when I approach when anyone approaches me and wants to learn from me. The second influence that I have comes from hip hop. Uh, there's a, a social um, saying in hip hop, each one teach one. And I've always really gravitated towards being part of a collective of synergy that when contributing to each other, it brings out an evolution. It brings you to another level that you may not be able to have uh, obtained by yourself. And, um, I've never done anything by myself. I've always had helpers. I've always had, um, contributors, whether they knew they were my mentors or not, you know, like growing up, um, I used to try to copy Michael Jordan all the time and want to play basketball like him. I never met him, but I looked up to him in the example that he set. And, um, I try to look exactly like him every time I played basketball and um, so I've always had a lot of different, um, people around me that were really good at sharing. And I've always tried to reiterate the same way 
using their their teaching methods and apply it to myself and share. Depending on the person, um, I always try to gauge their comfortability about what they're comfortable with me sharing and um, always ask the artist, you know, what they're looking for, what they would like me to share. And um, I like Alex Bacon's approach. He always told me, I'll teach you everything I know. <laughs> and uh, I, I like that. I like that. Um, I just like that saying. It made me feel really, I knew I couldn't learn everything that he knows, but for the simple fact that he'd be willing to share and say and volunteer saying it, don't worry, I, I'll share everything I know. I always felt, um, I felt like that was uh, a way that I wanted to teach. And, and so in a lot of ways, like I'm not, I haven't created, I, I never created my own protocol of teaching. I had great teachers and I just copied them. And I, I just try to share the same way they shared with me. Thank you. Um, uh, another question I have for you would be, um, and, and I will, sorry, I will look at the questions in the chat. Um, but, but I would say um, this year uh, coming up and a few of the months in this year that we're in right now uh, is Toronto's year of public art. And when you think about the opportunity that that is, what, what would be your greatest hope and your greatest aspiration for um, you know, an outcome, uh, a positive outcome of Toronto's year of public art? Ooh, that's a good question. I think my overall hopes for what I'm doing here is setting a standard for other Indigenous artists, to, 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 for them to see um, the potential and not look at anything as an obstacle or as a boundary, but just as an opportunity for them to contribute to the city. I think when I first came to the city, I never thought I'd be able to contribute anything positive because the environments that I grew up in and the people that I have, I had been around up, up until that point. But um, I think overall, what I want to see is continue to see the growth of awareness and Indigenous artists sharing in the city and, um, and us being able to tell our own stories for ourselves and um, creating a bridge for the natives that aren't from the city so that they can come here and have feel safe, feel like they're going to be safe and feel the security of the people that they're around and um, have a network that's already established. And when they do come here, the opportunities are there so that they can share and contribute. And, um, and that's my overall kind of goal with what I'm trying to do right now. I, I just want to give back everything. Like I've taken my whole life and I've been able and fortunate enough to like experience what I have. And it's made my life in, in a, a for lack of better words, it's made my life a lot easier. And um, I want to be able to show that side of things to my family. Because a lot of people in my family from my reserve, you know, they wouldn't have believed me if I just told them stories about what was happening to me. But when they started seeing it and seeing I was getting acknowledged or just seeing the consistency of me sharing art, it inspired a lot of people on my reserve. And um, that's the overall goal is for me to contribute to my community in a very positive way. And um, that's the way of the warrior for my community, you know, is to sacrifice themselves so that for the greater good of the rest of us. Thank you. Um, I, my next question is a two part question really. And it goes to the heart of um, what's next for, uh, do you think, in the graffiti art movement and, and what's next for you? And then I will preface that by saying, I have a couple of questions specifically about your most recent work. Um, what's next for graffiti? You know, graffiti is always going to evolve. Um, I was just mentioning this today that hip hop is uh, a very young person's culture. It's not meant to be, you know, like someone like me <laughs> isn't really supposed to be in hip hop anymore. <laughs> um, like when I when I was growing up in in uh, into the culture, 
I was a young teenager and um, I earned all my stripes by the time I turned 17. And it was like, that was the, that was the peak of it. It was like, well, there's no, there's nothing you can do. There's not, there's no further you can go. You became, I became an honorary member of the Zulu Kings, uh, the first native ever to be down with the Zulu Kings. Um, the Zulu Kings was created by the Black Nation. Originally, they were a gang called the Black Spades. And uh, essentially, they later became the Zulu Nation, which was the group that coined the whole terminology hip hop and put together that culture that we know as breaking and seeing, DJing and graffiti. And, um, and also beatboxing is, is another element that they include in that. But um, yeah, I was I just always was was um, tailored into this culture to to contribute and then pass the torch. And so for graffiti, I feel like um, it's taking over the art world, and it's exciting to see the respect that graffiti artists are finally getting acknowledged with and getting and, and the opportunities that they've been given. And um, my mentor is a legendary graffiti artist. Bacon is like, he's one of the best in the world. And like, I don't say that biasly. I say that in a very, very uh, critical way because I follow hip hop from its origins. And um, I don't use terms like legend loosely. Like if you, you, you have to be someone very special like Bacon <laughs> to get that title. And uh, he's definitely earned it. And um and so I feel like graffiti is heading into a less self-destructive path and into more of an opportunity for people to establish themselves in a healthy way, express themselves in a healthy way where there's no, um, there's no consequences that are part of a risky lifestyle. And uh, I think that answers the first part of the question. Um, what was the second part? Uh, the, the second part was what's next for you, but we, we could maybe save that um, as the last question, because that strikes me as maybe a good note to end on. <laughs> yeah. So when we, cool. get the, when we get the five minute warning, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll introduce that one. Um, a question that has come in from the group is, um, are, oh, yes. Yeah, so I, are your children following in your path as artists? And, and I will say it was a pleasure meeting your son and your daughter at the Lansdowne Underpass uh, site. And my, I know what I hope the answer is. Well, I think they've already passed me a long time ago. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, you know, in their eyes, I'm ancient. I'm like really old. <laughs> but um, my son and my daughter, uh, our way of spending time together was art. You know, I was always dancing, so I'd bring them to all my practices and all my sessions and any jams that I was invited to. Um, there, there were VIPs everywhere I went. That was my posse, me, my son, and my daughter. That's every like that's how everyone knew me. Was like they couldn't believe I was a single dad. Number one, everyone was like, "What? How are you raising these guys by yourself?" And um, and I I I just never seen myself doing hip-hop for too long once I became a father because I wanted to um I wanted to be a good example on my kids but I also wanted to show them the importance of of evolving as a human and so I kind of just passed the torch to them and I didn't really put any pressure on them to to follow my steps I don't feel like that's fair for anyone to have to follow somebody I just encourage them to to be to be their best at, and, and, and how to follow their heart, how to follow their, their path and not have to feel any pressure to fit in my shoes or have to be like me in any way whatsoever. I don't really feel like, you know, like, like the lifestyle that I lived was something I would ever want them to go through. I feel like they're the, they're the generation where the trauma stops. You know, I, I'm, I'm the last one with it. And I don't mind carrying it. It's okay. I was built for it. But them, they would never be able to. I don't think they'd be able to live with it. And so I'm, they're, my, they're the, the light of the future for me. You know, they're, they're contributing healthy. My daughter goes to U of T. 
No one in my family ever went to university, straight to university. No one. My daughter went at 17. Was She completed her first year. Now she's in her second year. She's going to be turning 19 um, in uh, next month on the 13th. And um, my son is also, he finished uh, a year in, um, at uh, Canada College in North Bay, Ontario. And he uh, graduated from the aerial technician course. And now he's going to be pursuing next year uh, to become a helicopter pilot. And um, I didn't finish school. I, I went to, uh, I, I took a different route. And um, because I knew how my mom was raised, and the effects of what residential school had done to her, I completely um, rejected any institution, anything that had to do with the government of Canada, anything that had to do with the education system here. I completely, um, I completely like just separated myself. I began decolonizing myself at a young age for the sake of my children so that they wouldn't have to grow up with a parent that was raised with all these dysfunctional behaviors. I didn't want them to inherit that. And so when I began the decolonizing, I started to learn about more healthier behaviors and, and I just wanted to share that with them. And so they're definitely doing their own thing. They're definitely going to be living their own lives. And I'm super proud of them, no matter what they decide to do. Um, I just know that they're going to live a completely different lifestyle than I did. And I felt like that was the job for me. That was my main mission is to keep them away from that, uh, experiencing any of that kind of trauma. Thank you. You, um, you launched a, a very important song back in September. Would you, would you be comfortable sharing a bit about that and... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did a song. Um, I actually recorded this song six years ago. And it was for my the last album I created, which was called Pass the Torch. And um, the song didn't make the cut for the album because it just stood out too different. It was really, really poppy, you know, pop music style. And... Um, the music I was creating at that point was really underground boom bap style rap. And um, it didn't make the album. So fast forward to um, six years later this year, um, I was part of a documentary and the director was insistent that that song was part of the uh, soundtrack for the documentary that I was part of. And the documentary and that song just didn't make any sense. But when the discovery of the, uh, the 215 children was announced, it wasn't news to me. I already knew about that. I already knew about all the, all the stuff that was happening and had been happening to my nation. Just no one ever believed us, you know, including my friends that I, I would tell and they wouldn't believe me. It was just such a, I felt like I was in the twilight zone. It was like, why would I lie about something like that? Why would I even try to make that up? And it was very discouraging um, to even try and share anything with anyone about my culture. And when I made that song, I wanted to show what a native person, a native adult would do with the white nation's children versus what, what they did to our children. And so I made a song and that song um, I sampled uh, this boy's choir. They're called Liberia. And Liberia sings in old Latin. And they're actually the boy's choir that sings for the queen, uh, the queen and her family in uh, London, UK. I did a lot of research on this. I really put a lot of thought into how am I going to create a song that is going to help heal my nation from the colonial process that's been happening here, the colonization the oppression, the extreme poverty that we've been going through. And how do I share a message that is deeper than just what I could do on my own with just the lyrics? And I thought the symbolism of me working with these youth um, to, to sing the hook and to be part of the song and to sing in old Latin, like in the church sounds, I just thought it created a really unique sound. And um 
and my intention was to show, you know, what it, what Native people would do with children versus what would happen to our children. My my mom, my grandparents, you know, all the the, the people of Turtle Island. What happened to us with the Jesuits and the Catholic Church and all the different institutions that were here to oppress us essentially and um i thought it was one of those it would be a good um like my intentions were for it to be a, a kind of a shocking experience but but awakening experience for people to be like damn man this native doesn't have any hatred in him he doesn't he doesn't hate us he doesn't hate the white nation he doesn't you know he doesn't have any hatred in him it's all unconditional love and he's showing it through this song of through his words, but also through the inclusion of the boys' choir singing the way that they sing, and that's and the there's a Phil Collins song that um, I was gonna sample, and instead of sampling it, because there's no way I could afford a Phil Collins sample, <laughs> I, I got the kids to sing the hook, and it's and and um, the song is um, it's called Air in the Night, and um, the 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 hook says how could i ever forget the past time but phil collins says in his song how could i ever forget the first time two different songs with two different meanings that's for sure but um i felt like it was really it really matched the the, the instrumental that i was uh writing my lyrics to and um so yeah that's a bit of a background of that song if you ever get a chance to to check it out it's on all of the digital platforms right now. It's called Air in the Night by Q Rock. And um, I dedicate that song to all the survivors and all those that we lost, um, to just all the, the colonization that's been happening here and all the different institutions that have contributed to those, uh, those horrific things that have been happening to my, to my people. And a lot of those things I would like to make a point are still happening. It hasn't stopped. And that's why our people, the Anishinaabe, all the First Nations, that's why our voice, we're demanding our voices to be heard now. Because there have been moments where we had movements that were happening, um, the missing and murdered Indigenous women movement, um, I don't know more. Um, and even before me, before I was even around, uh, you know, the, the American Indian movement um, was heavily influenced and involved with uh, the Black Panther Party, with the civil rights movements. Um, they go hand in hand. And uh, the women rights movements and um, you know, First Nations people have been fighting the whole time alongside with all of these different groups, minorities that are being oppressed. And um, I feel like it's important to address that these issues are still happening and that they need to stop. The systematic racism needs to be completely dismantled and there needs to be a new approach and a new relationship developed with first nations here on turtle island and everyone else so so very well put and uh and thank you for sharing that q and uh and and for telling the story of your song um you know when i when i uh listen to you share all of that. I, I'm one of the things that we bump up against at Street Art Toronto uh, in an effort to um, involve and learn from and uh, provide a platform for knowledge sharing by uh, Indigenous artists and elders and uh, knowledge keepers um, is um, well-intentioned artists who are not from the community, who uh, imagine that they are supporting the community by trying to include, for example, a medicine wheel uh, or, or a symbol from Indigenous culture. And uh, can you share for the artists who might be um, uh, on the chat or with us uh, tonight, can you share um a bit about the the reasons why that is so very problematic um yeah there's, it, it has a lot of layers uh, i think one of the biggest 
that my mom, I remember my mother sharing with me from a very young age is that our voice is never, it's silenced, you know, we're muted. And, um, you know, uh, I was always taught that it was going to be my responsibility one day to become a voice for the voiceless. And um, I think with those that are passionate about the indigenous lifestyle, um, it's not looked at as an honoring thing when people mimic us or people tell our stories for us. Because the part of the oppression is that there's a privilege there. And the privilege is, is that you get to share native art and get to share native stories, but you don't understand that the, the oppression is still in a, that's part of the oppression. It's part of, by you telling our story is still oppressing us. We we're here, we're alive. We're volunteering our time uh, to share and it's sharing without expectations. We're sharing. There's no, there's no, there's no agenda for us. If there is an agenda, it's, it's positive. It's about, it's about humanity being, being able to, to, to be able to tell our own stories and, and learn from one another, respect each other, respect our differences. We don't have to believe the same thing, but it's important that we, re- under- we come to an understanding and we respect one another. Um, our stories are part of the land. Our culture comes from the land. Uh, my father always said that the confusement came when they told us that our culture was lost. And my father would always say, our culture was never lost. It was us as humans that were lost. And I think a lot of, my, of our people, the First Nations, are finding themselves again. And through the symbolism of the sacred geometry and the teachings, we're putting ourselves back into our education system because our education system is ceremony. We learn our education through the ceremonies, through the practice of using the medicine wheel, through the practice of using the seven grandfather teachings, our value system, our guiding principle system, through the medicine wheel, through the seven grandfather teachings, through the 13 grandmother clan system. All of these are our education system. And it gives us an opportunity, puts us on a platform to be able to share our ways of life. If I were to draw a symbol that I didn't know fully understand the teachings of it, and I were to just paint it and just put it there to include it because I feel like it's fitting a criteria that's being requested by the city. Um, I don't, I wouldn't never feel comfortable doing that. I would never feel comfortable sharing anything that I wasn't fully educated in. And I think with some artists these days, it's, a. I feel like a lot of the artwork is a mashup of many different influences. And in Western culture, you're taught to take from other cultures and include it into your art to tell your story. But in this situation, I think this is going to be a good icebreaker to create awareness for people to say, question themselves about taking so much and start learning about cultural appropriation and what's appropriate and what's not. You know, one of the things that really opened my eyes about cultural appropriation is Halloween. I started to really think about different costumes I wore over the years and how many of them were actually like really inappropriate. I used to dress up like a ninja all the time thinking it was cool. But then I started traveling to Japan and started learning from my friends about Japanese culture and like started to understand like, wow, I, I, I never want to come across as that person that I had come across as. And it, it, it took me to travel to Japan to learn that because I, I was in the middle of their culture and seeing it for myself and starting to like realize that what I had learned over here on Turtle Island about Japan, none of it was true. I had to literally learn from that culture. So to be here on Turtle Island, you're surrounded by indigenous people. And if you're ever taught the symbolism, if you're taught the culture, you're now able to communicate with us. You now have, uh, you, you, you now have the insider secret language that we, we look for in one another. And uh, that's, that's, an, that's an amazing thing to, to, to have. But to go out and to share it 
like it's just a symbol for art. It's to us, it's not. That's not the purpose of our paintings. A lot of it is based off of honoring the truth. And if you don't know the full details of that symbol, you shouldn't be sharing it yet because you yourself don't know the truth. You have to discover that yourself through research and cross-referencing and, you know, just discovering it for yourself. But um, I think the biggest thing for me for this question is to make sure that Indigenous voices have a platform where they feel safe to share and uh, tell our own stories for ourselves. Because for way too long, other people have been telling you the history of us. And I think we can all agree now that that history was really messed up. And there was a lot of lies. And there was a lot of um, things that should never have happened to us that did happen. And I think now that it's on the table, that the oppression is still existent, and right now in today's culture towards indigenous people, I think people now finally will begin to express that they don't tolerate this anymore. They're not going to tolerate, you know, institutions killing babies, you know, institutions, uh, you know, essentially co colonizing native people anymore. You know, our way of life may not be the same as the Western direction is, but we have so much that we can contribute to this, the cultures that are living here. And um, that's essentially like the, the part that we're fighting for. We're fighting for our voices to be heard so that we can share. And um, if other artists take that in consideration, that, um, you know, I, although they may feel they may be honoring us by sharing our art, they're actually repressing us from our voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that would be a, a, a good segue to perhaps a, one very last really quick question. And because I have word that I then need to hand it back to Elder Wabagoon, but um, that uh, response would be a, a wonderful segue to draw attention back to your magnificent Daniel's mural project and w what it must be like for you to go from creating a mural where you create the design concept and you paint it on the wall to now you create the concept and you uh, release it uh, to others to actually implement and and what is wh what is that experience like for you and then elder wabagoon i promise i'll give give it back to you uh for, it's overwhelming for me um because i've um i've discovered a new platform that I didn't know existed. And I've also discovered something within me that I didn't realize that I was doing to myself and I was putting myself in a box. You know, I had thought I was, by being a muralist, I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is what I can see myself doing forever. And I'm, I love painting, but being part of this project, being part of this team, this this collective of people because there's so many people behind the scenes that no one's spoken to that they may not know have contributed and everyone has contributed a lot like i feel like i've done the least amount of work out of everyone right now because i just all i did was draw like something that i do naturally very you know in a very short period of time but what's what's happened behind the scenes to get us to this point where we are right now today has taken people countless hours of work and dedication and and for that, like, I have to acknowledge all those people. It's, I'm so grateful for them. And this learning experience to be part of a professional team has blown me away. Um, being part of Street Art Toronto, I thought blew my hair away already. But being able to be part of a different group, an organization who works totally different and who has contributed to me being part of every single step, even though I didn't have to be, I asked for it. And it was very discouraging at times, very, very uh, confusing. All the emails that were going on, like I'm contrarian, but that's one thing I didn't mention this whole time, but um, I'm naturally a backwards thinker, but I've come to learn that actually in my culture, it's, that's our way of thinking forward. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's, it's been a, a, an absolutely 
amazing learning experience and i um, super grateful for the team that I'm part of. And um, yeah, like they, they need to have more. I wish I could shout out everybody. I'm, I'm terrible with names. You know, there's a few of them that I do know. Um, I, and I do have to say a big Chen Miigwech to Elder Wabagoon. Um, I was praying to get an elder in my life in the city. I've, I have a connection, a strong connection back home to my elders, but I, I wasn't able to find any elders in Toronto. And um, I put down some tobacco and I prayed to find one. And Elder Wabagoon came into my life and, and, um, and answered my prayers. And, and I was able to, to, to be part of something that I just never imagined was possible before. If you asked me to do a design for you before for a window, I probably would have talked myself out of it. And, and just to be part of this team and to see how far it's gone. And now the installation is going up. Today, when I went to the building, I, I'm right now, it's surreal. It just it doesn't feel like it's real. Like it's, it's like, I can't believe it. It's, you know, it's, um, it's an amazing feeling, but it's also, um, I think part of one of the things about me is that I don't hold on to anything. I was taught to let go of everything. So most people have a way of letting go of only the negative things in their life, <laughs> and uh, which, which is understanding. But I was raised to let go of everything, the good and the not so good. And um, so I've already let go of this art. I've already let it go. It's like, it's no longer mine. It's, you know, it's, it's out there. But um, to be part of it, the team, I think that's been a huge learning experience for me as a professional artist. Um, it's definitely opened my eyes to see the options that I have. And um, I'd like to leave it off like this. I am just getting started. You're just getting uh, to see the beginning of what I'm doing. But the work that I have to do, it's far from over. Um, you know, like uh, I'm still very competitive with myself. And uh, because I, I've been on this path, I'm not trying to slow down anytime soon. I'm just getting started. The warm up is over. Now it's showtime. Now it's time for me to continue to share, push boundaries, create new, um, create new standards for my people and for other artists in the city too. And um, just keep doing my thing. Thank, thank you so much, Q. And uh, and with that, I will say, bring it on. And uh, back. <laughs> thank you, Carolyn. Chamiguetch. Oh, so miigwetch, miigwetch to you, Q. Uh, what a night! Uh, my heart is full. And McGwitch, Carolyn, and everyone for joining us this evening. We hope you will continue to follow the progress on the Daniels Mural Project. The next event in our Treaties Recognition Week will be taking place tomorrow at noon with our collaborator, Street Art Toronto, titled Anishinaabe 101, including treaties, with traditional helper Perry McLeod Shabogish. Please visit the Daniels site for more information on how you can register for this event. So now back to uh, Dean Shuandu. Uh, thank you, Elder Rock Bagon. Uh, thank you, Kill Rock, for sharing with us your, your creative journey, I would say. Um, it, it, it's really fascinating to see how um, the various forms of art that you, you do participate in, whether it's from music to, to murals to um, storytelling, really, through, through, through the narratives that you're creating. It's really inspiring. Um, and I'm very thankful that you're willing to share this journey with us, with our students. Um, and we're very glad that, that we're, we're able to uh, work with you um, and, and to be able, able to learn from you. And, and I hope that uh, in the next few steps, that the journey of our students, the journey of our school, that we can walk alongside of you so that we can each learn from this process and each um, go forward and closer to the truth that, that exists um, for all of us. So thank you so much. Thanks.